Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It is a wonderful honor to be here. Um, I spent a lot of time here a month during the Breivik crisis, and it is worth saying how much Norway impressed me at the time. Um, the king, the prime minister, now NATO Gensek, just the way the country came together in this horrible moment. Um, and so I do want to acknowledge that. Countries don't go through these things very often, but Norway came through it very, very well. Um, and I've also come to a bunch of Nobel Prize speeches in the other Munch room called City Hall. <laughs> um, and the first one I ever did was Elie Wiesel. And I, I remember that very, very well, um, very moving. So here we are in the middle of a crisis. Um, sometimes we exaggerate the importance of crises because more crises happen. But this seems to me, on one level, a continuation of the war in Ukraine that began in 2014, 2015, which we didn't take seriously enough. But in a way, it's also um, a continuation of a rejection by Vladimir Putin beginning at least in 2007 um, to the international post-Cold War order, which he felt was imposed on Russia at its weakest point and which he never particularly accepted. So you can argue that in some ways what he's done in Ukraine was pretty shocking, and it is, um, because it's not little green men, but long-range artillery, bombers, and tanks. It's a whole different order of being. And of course, that has been a great prise de conscience, a, a big wake-up call for everyone in Europe, including Sweden and Finland, but also including a whole generation, let's call them the millennials, kids who grew up for 30 years with the idea of war being absurd, being something else, being something, Asian, African, Afghanistan, but not us. So this will affect their lives forever, I think, at, at least their incomes forever, their taxes, um, the way their countries look at the military, and it will militarize our societies in ways that are rather tragic, it seems to me, but probably inevitable. And there'll be a lot more troops around, particularly on the, what we like to call the Eastern flank, um, and the strategic space of, that Ukraine represented between Poland and Russia, between NATO and Russia. I mean, we call it, I mean, these were gray zones, but they're also, in, in a way, in NATO terms, comfortable spaces. Those are gone. So it's a big change. Now, part of what I've been asked to talk about is, is the U.S. back? Well, of course, I'd argue in a way that the U.S. never left. I, I, I mean, I think it's a great exaggeration to think that the U.S. left. The U.S. is always interested in Europe and in the alliance, and it, and it, it meddles as it can, all out of altruism, to be sure. Um, but after all, it was Obama, the sainted Obama, who many of us miss, who pulled tanks and troops out of Europe. And, um, and then Crimea came, and it was Obama who didn't want to send javelins to Ukraine or any kind of weaponry. Um, and it was Trump who put the troops back in or allowed them to come back in. Um, it was under Trump that the enhanced forward brigades were put into Poland and into the Baltic states. Uh, now, the headlines were terrifying. You know, Trump calls NATO obsolete. Trump bashes allies. Um, but um, the fact is, by a skinny margin, the system worked, and he was restrained from doing anything incredibly stupid, though he said many stupid things. And as I say, um, 
the U.S. military commitment to Europe actually increased during the Trump presidency in ways that send direct signals to Russia, and it also involved serious training of the Ukrainian army in ways we see the benefit of today. This was mentioned earlier, but the U.S., the U.K., Canada did most of that work, and it's been very good work, and it continues to this day. Um, now, I don't want to exaggerate. You, you know, of course, Trump wanted to punish Germany and reduce troops, and he drove everyone nuts and made many Europeans think he was about to destroy the world. Um, and maybe he tried, but he then got attracted by some other shiny new thing, like North Korea and his love for Kim Jong-un, whatever. Um, now, Joe Biden is someone I've known for a really, really long time. No one could be a correspondent in Washington dealing with foreign affairs and not know Joe Biden. <laughs> it was impossible. Um, and the younger Joe Biden was pretty impressive. I mean, this, this Joe Biden, I think, is better in meetings than he sometimes uh, appears. Even today, by the way, in Tokyo, he suddenly announced the U.S. would defend Taiwan militarily which was quite an extraordinary statement that's not much strategic, strategic ambiguity there. Um, and we don't know how much his own people will try to walk that back in, in the hours to come. But Biden is, in a way, I've always thought of him, he's the last transatlanticist. I mean, it's partly his um, generation, but it's his instinct, um, and it's, it's really his his care. I mean, he really does believe in the alliance, and he really does believe that, that the United States is better for having European friends and allies, and that Europe is better for it too. And actually, Biden, unlike um, Trump, certainly doesn't ask for a big price for that alliance. Um, he sees it as crucial. Um, but they had a terribly rocky start, as you know. I mean, I once said to Jake Sullivan, I thought you guys were the competent ones. What happened <laughs> over Afghanistan, for instance, and even over AUKUS? But what they've done with Ukraine, it's quite hard to fault. Um, they have um, brought allies along. They've worked hard, even with the European Union, <laughs> to coordinate sanctions. That's not always... A, as you all know, the easiest task um, because of 27 countries with different issues. Um, but they've listened, they've spent time in Brussels, they've, um, they've cared. And I think they've shown that U.S. leadership is important. You could argue, some have argued, that in a way it recreates a dependency that, that Europe has been trying to shed because the Germans, for instance, have been very happy to nestle again under the arm of American leadership, when, of course, the French would prefer <laughs> that, um, that Europe be better able to define its own interests and not rely on the Americans quite so much. Um, there are obviously worries about Biden. There are worries about the midterms. There are worries about uh, Trump or someone like Trump coming back. Those are real concerns. They're legitimate concerns. But I would want to stress to you that among the few things that have bipartisan support in the United States and in Congress is NATO. I mean, Senate, House, completely bipartisan support. There's very little opposition to helping Ukraine. $40 billion were just appropriated, 40 billion. I mean, the French, if I could be wrong, spend about 41 billion euros a year on defense. And $40 billion is more than at least Russia's whole, whole, um, whole uh, military budget. So it's quite serious. Um, and it is intriguing, others have said this before me, but with Sweden and Finland, um, 23 of the EU's 27 members will be part of NATO. So it becomes less interesting to try to divide the two. I mean, the things will be harder, of course, or could, 
or could get harder, but it's harder to think of them as really separate anymore, particularly given the four that are not part of um, NATO aren't really considered very important military or strategic partners. Um, there is impatience in Washington, without question, to get back to China, where the real rivalry is, um, the peer competitor, as Francois said. It's not just ideological, but it's technical, trade, scientific, regional. Um, the issue of containment keeps coming up, but China can't be limited. I think it, it can be discussed. Perhaps it, perhaps it can be contained. Um, but China also, it's worth stressing, they feel they have the wind in their sails. Um, it's a matter of self-confidence. Uh, Xi Jinping is very arrogant, very blustery. He's sure that the United States is in decline, that the West is in decline, not just Russia in decline. Um, and he's quite happy to have the West and Russia fighting themselves through the Ukrainians. Now, the Chinese have been embarrassed by this war, to be sure, but um, I think they, they consider their rise is inexorable, inevitable, and unstoppable. Um, so there will be lots to come. I mean, if the issue here is superpower rivalries, well, it's only those two now. I think Russia, at the end of this war, if it ends, and no matter how it ends, uh, Russia will be weakened. It will be more dependent on China. It will need new markets for its energy. Um, so we'll see how it ends. Um, the one last point I would make here, because I think it's important, this war also, I think, is very bad news for our multilateral institutions and rules because they have basically failed. Um, so one wonders what happens in the end to the UN with both Russia and China on the Security Council, even more isolated and angry than before. Does the OECD have any kind of future without Russia? What happens to European security order let alone the World Trade Organization. And of course, we're all dealing with a newer world of secondary economic sanctions, which is warfare, which the Chinese have been studying for some time now. So I've overextended my time, but I think these are themes that um, all of us can easily discuss. And I thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Thanks.